Good morning. We're going to get things started this morning. a whole day since I stopped so you can hold me this child away strong in the faith Lord you are the refuge that I can't wait to get to cause I can't let a day go can't let a day go by without thanking you for the joy that you bring to my life It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. Beautiful, beautiful. When trouble seems to rain on my dreams, it's not a big, not a big deal. Little crush on the bugs off my windshield, cause you're showing me that. Showing me if you I'm free. You'll feel the refuge that I just got to get to, so I won't let a day go, won't let a day go by, put the drop top down, turn it up, I'm ready to fly, and oh, there's something about the way, your sun shines on my face, if the love's so true, I can never get enough of you, this feeling can't be wrong, I'm about to get my worship on, take me away. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. Beautiful, beautiful day. Beautiful, beautiful. I've got no need to worry. I've got no room for doubt. No matter what's coming at me, you'll always be the beautiful I sing about. There ain't no limitations to your amazing grace. Your amazing grace. And there's something about the way your love shines on my face. Oh no, I can never get enough of you. This feeling can't be wrong. I'm about to get my worship on. I'm gonna sing a brand new song. I'm about to get my worship on. Take me away on this beautiful day. Let's greet one another this morning. High five. I'll check with them first thing in the morning, and then I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know. Hello. 
Hi, Miss Abby. How are you? Good. Is your friend? What's her name? Zoe. Oh, Zoe. Hi, Zoe. My name's Russ. We have another Zoe. Yeah. Good. Okay. Welcome. I'd like to begin introducing you to another Zoe. Yeah. Page of a book. have a seat. Don't the decorations look beautiful? So, yeah, and, and I know that uh, Sharon's not here, but to Sharon and all those who helped last Sunday in, in putting all this together, thank you very, very much. It looks wonderful. Um, I see some new faces. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Sean Eckhoff. I'm the pastor here at Maranatha Baptist Fellowship. And we'd like to welcome you. Inside your bulletin, if you look on the far right side, there's a little tear-off. If you could fill that out and leave it for us as you leave in the blessing box at the back, that would be great. And for anybody else, if you have a prayer request, uh, write your prayer request and, and leave it for us too. Uh, any praises this week? We got to see your dad Thursday. Got to see your dad Thursday on Thanksgiving Day. What a, a great day to see your dad. Praise God. Praise God. And yes, thank you from from all of us for the ones that have, have been making the cookies. And uh, and thank Gary and John for leading the Bible study too. Uh, any other praises? Richard? Let's pray for him and, and, and the, his liver condition. And that was, that was really good. So thank you thank you to everybody who brought the soups, too. That was really, really good. Kevin? <laughs> I, you're talking about your wife, right? <laughs> um, for those of you who haven't heard, we've, we had been looking for a house um, and... and we, we were concerned with the house that we're living in now being what made us sick all last winter. Uh, still not 100% sure about that, but it couldn't help. I mean, it, it, the, the water was really bad. We started getting better after we stopped drinking the water, buying bottled water. But we bought a house. So uh, <laughs> praise God. Um, so uh, we will be... Getting it rid there, it's, it's a bit of a fixer-upper, so we're going to do the fixer-upper portion, get it clean, and we'll probably be moving in at the beginning of January. And then we'll be done with the house that we're in. 
So praise God. We're, we're excited about that. Um, also, oh, go ahead. On Thanksgiving Day. I know. Yeah. yeah. The only time I went to see my family was uh, during uh, my lunch hour. Oh. We had our Thanksgiving dinner, so that it was still good to spend time with them. Long. But it was just a really busy day. Oh, praise God, you made it through it, and you got to spend a little bit of time with your family. Yeah. Where, where, where have the days gone of all stores closing on Thanksgiving so you can spend time with your families? It's gone to Black Friday sales. I wanted I wanted to share one more praise. Um, when we left Friday to come back home, Paige drove from Sterling, Kansas, all the way to Salina, Kansas. Yes, <laughs> she did. She did really well. She did. I, good. I knew there was a reason why I just shouldn't have been on the road. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, Paige. <laughs> It's a praise for that, that instance, a prayer request for future instances. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. All right, any other praises? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you today with grateful and thankful hearts. Lord, I thank you for this past week. Uh, as I mentioned in Sunday school, I thank you so much for last week's, um, the, the day of Thanksgiving to to make people stop and remember what there is to be thankful for. Lord, just allow us to continue on in the spirit of thanksgiving that we can be thankful every day for even the smallest of things. Lord, we have so many reasons to praise your name. Be with us as we continue to sing and praise and glorify your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship, and please stand for the reading of God's Word. Psalms 100, a thanksgiving psalm. On your feet now, applaud God. Bring a gift of laughter. Sing yourself into his presence. Know this, God is God, and God, God. He made us, we didn't make him. We're his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talking praise. Thank him, worship him, for God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lamb of Glory this morning. We will worship the Lamb.
This morning, Lord, we do we come to adore you, Father God. We thank you for this season where you saw the mess we were in, Father God, and you stepped down. You sent Jesus from heaven to be born, Father, to free us from our sins, Father God, to free us from ourselves. Father, we are so thankful, and we do come and adore you this morning, Father God. We ask that you would speak through Pastor Sean as he brings the message this morning that opens up this special season of the coming of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Before we get uh, to the message uh, portion, you'll notice in your bulletins a uh, information on the Lottie Moon offering as I almost fall over. It looks like this has a lot of information about Lottie Moon. And as you remember, last year we did Lottie Moon, and I promoted it. Uh, Lottie Moon is very, very, very important. Uh, this year's uh, theme is totally his, heart, hands, and voice. Uh, so with that, I want to show a short video, and then I'll speak a little bit more about this. When we got into Somalia, there were about uh, 150 Somalis who were followers of Jesus Christ. By 1997, only four of them were left alive. It was like getting in a plane in the New Testament and getting off the plane in the Old Testament. And I, it was like I had flown into hell. Just close our eyes While half of the world Is dying of thirst Let's swing the doors Wide open And hammer down Dividing walls We are the woke me up at 1.30 in the morning, uh, she said, uh, Tim's having a, a really bad asthma attack, and as soon as I saw him, I knew it was worse than anything I'd seen before. And I <clears throat> walk into this little emergency room, and the doctor and two nurses, I think, are sitting on a bench against the wall uh, with their heads in their hand, and there lays Tim, my son, uh, on the table, and, and he had died.
we have to answer the question, not, not, not the question, am I willing to live for Jesus? But there's a real possibility that your parents have to answer the question, are we as a family willing to die for Jesus? And that was, that was an important time in my family's life. To ask the question, is Jesus worth it? And, and not, not me walking some aisle or being baptized in some church or growing up in a Christian community. Are Somalis worth my taking Jesus to them to the extent that it might cost me my life? And as a family, we had to answer the question, yes, Jesus was worth it. Is Jesus worth it? Lost his son in Somalia. And the reason they keep him shadowed out, as you probably have guessed, is it's a security issue. They are risking their life to be there sharing Christ. How can we help them through Lottie Moon? Every dollar that is collected during this month of December for Lottie Moon offering every last cent goes to international missions. It doesn't go to pay the electric bill at the IMB. It doesn't go to pay salaries at the IMB. It doesn't go to anything but to help the missionaries share Christ. They're sacrificing as much as their own son and being in a third world country can we sacrifice a few dollars? Um, all right. Um, with that, this morning, and, and this just came up, and I wanted to read this verse because it, it kind of pertains. Um, Galatians 6. Galatians 6, verse 9. It says, And let us not grow weary of doing good. Let us not grow weary of doing good. And, and Jeannie mentioned, it could stop right there. And, and, and it would be perfect. Don't grow weary of doing good. But then it goes on and says, For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. couple verses, well, the verse right before that says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Our sending money, we may never get to see the benefits of the money that we send. We just sent 74 boxes to kids somewhere across this globe for Christmas. It may be their very first time of ever receiving a gift. And we did it knowing that we will probably never see what came of that this side of heaven. But we did it. In the same way, as I get bit in the back of a leg by a plant, we may never see what good our dollars bring when we give to Lottie Moon this side of heaven. But don't grow weary of doing good. Uh, with that, this the last year during the Advent season, as we lit the Advent candles and, and read a piece of Scripture, I had the elders eat, and their wives each come up each week. This year, I decided I wanted to involve the youth. So uh, to start this year's Advent season off, Paige and Cordell are going to do the reading and lighting of the first candle. Psalm 71, 4 through 6. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope. 
my trust, O Lord, from my, mouth, uh, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Another praise. He actually gave the lighter back. <laughs> it's not lighting fires in the charcoal grill or tearing it apart and finding springs and flints. And All right. Um, I'll reread that. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust. O oh Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are, the, uh, you are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Now, I didn't specifically ask anybody, so this might be a dangerous thing. Um, would anybody like to come up and share of their hope in Jesus Christ? or of the, their praise continually being on the Lord for any reason of, of, of thanksgiving as we start off the Advent season. Anybody? Okay. I wasn't sure, but I thought I'd give it a shot. Um, and I need this too. All right. The, the sermon series for this, Chris, the, this, this Christmas season or this year is entitled What God Wants for Christmas. Uh, it was inspired by a book by the same title written by Amy Bradford. Our family has been going through this book, What God Wants for Christmas, for years. I, I couldn't even tell you how many years. Eight, probably at least. And... Um, we, we've really enjoyed doing it. So I decided to make it uh, the sermon series. And, and so I've had to make some modifications, had to do some things so it would actually fit into four weeks of Christmas. Because what it is, is it, the book has seven sections, and it can be read all at one time or one section each night, seven days, starting seven days before Christmas. Um, each section has its own present that's to be opened as part of the surprise of what God wants for Christmas. And each present is introduced with a short poem uh, identifying the piece. So after this week's introductory message, uh, the next three weeks there will be an opening of two presents. Yeah, see, yes, we like presents. So there will be an opening of two presents and an introduction of some special pieces. Um, and then on Christmas Eve, we will open the seventh. So if you don't want to miss the surprise revelation of the seventh gift, you need to mark on your calendars. Uh, we're having a Christmas Eve service, and it will be starting at 6 o'clock. Um, and before that, we're going to have a short communion service, uh, again this year like we did last, and, and that will be at 5.30. And, and like I said, it's, it will be a short communion service because we have to be finished and, and cleaned up and everything set back up for the Christmas Eve service. And this year, we're actually going to uh, be doing a play as well. So the, the Christmas Eve service will start with the communion. And then at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a play, um, some Christmas carols, and then a short message before we reveal the seventh gift of what God wants for Christmas. So don't forget, invite your friends. And if you're not sure how to invite anyone, just take a look at this video. You can do this, man. No, I can't. Yes, you can. 
It's just church. You can invite him. Just do it. What's the worst that could happen? Hey, Roger. Hey, you want to go to church with me and my family this Christmas? They'll have plans on Christmas. Why don't you try and make me? <laughs> oh! Bah! Humbug! Christmas a humbug? Surely you don't mean that. I do mean that. In fact, every nitwit that runs about with the phrase a Merry Christmas on his lips should be run over by a tractor and buried with a stick of holly through his heart! Okay, come on, come on. Seriously, you've got to snap out of this. Just invite him. Oh, but what if I say the wrong thing? Listen, I know you don't have a life, so... Man, it seems like you don't get out much. I'm betting you don't have a lot of friends, right? Man, you are wildly unpopular. Hey, Roger! <laughs> What's wrong with you? I have a heart condition. Oh, oh great. I don't have a pulse. Okay, now that that's out of your system, quit being silly. There's nothing to be afraid of. Hey, Roger. Oh, hey, Paul. It's looking good. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's getting there. What's up, man? Well, I, I don't know if you have any plans or not yet, but Christine and the kids and I, well, we would love it if you came to our Christmas service at our church. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, actually, we were planning on attending somewhere. We just, we hadn't decided where. Yeah, I, I guess that'd be fine. Uh, yeah, man, that sounds great. <laughs> I, I had the opportunity, while, while home on Thanksgiving, uh, with, visiting with my, my mom, um, I was able to share a little bit with her that she she didn't really know. <laughs> Um, I, I shared with her. Well, you know, we got to talking, and and I said, you know, it, it's a, it's amazing where where God has has placed me and what God has done in my life, and and she said something to the effect, well, well, you were always a good boy. Mm. Well, um, I know a little bit more about me than you must know about me, Mom. Um, did I ever tell you I was an alcoholic? didn't know. It's because I was a functioning alcoholic. It's because I could lay off long enough to come home on vacation or I would just tell them, hey, I'm going to go out with some friends tonight, even when I was home on vacation, and they knew not to expect me. And, and, and then when I'd get up the next morning and, and I'd have a hangover, she'd say, a little bit too much to drink last night? Yeah, last night and every night for the last several years. But I didn't tell her that. her that. I said, yeah, a little bit too much to drink, Mom. Sorry. She had no idea. So then I got to share with her, did you realize I smoked two and a half packs of cigarettes a day? That one really surprised her. She's like, but growing up, you had a dad that did that. Why, why would you do the same? You didn't like it. I know. I, I, don't, have an, I don't have an explanation for that. I, I don't know. Um, and she asked, she said, what is it that, how did you get turned around? How did you, how did you stop? I said, well, the cigarettes, I stopped kind of two reasons. One, I stopped, the date that I stopped was April 2nd, 1994. The day I moved back home <laughs> was April 3rd, 1994. I didn't want to give her a heart attack because I knew that's what would happen if she found out I smoked. So I, I told her, I said, Mom, I stopped for you, number one. Number two, it, it, that was about the time the, the prices of cigarettes were going through the roof, and I just didn't want to spend money on them anymore. Um, and then she says, well, how did, you, how did you quit drinking? How did... I said, Mom, you invited me to church. I've told you several weeks, and uh, the reason I am where I am is because I was invited to church. So she got to see this side of heaven <laughs> some of the fruit of reaching out and inviting someone to church and sharing Christ and she got to see it in her own son 
So needless to say, she was shocked. <laughs> but at the same time, she was very happy. Um, and what a perfect time, Thanksgiving. So anyway, invite your friends and family to church. It may be the only reason they come. All right. So in the spirit of what God wants for Christmas, and you just saw me look over there and gesture, next week there will be something there to gesture at. We don't have it yet. So just keep that in mind, and next week you'll know what I'm talking about. But in the spirit of what God wants for Christmas, I told you that every character was in, in introduced with a poem, and since this week is kind of an introduction and it has nothing to do with the actual book, What God Wants for Christmas, I just felt there needed to be a poem here. So, Thanksgiving is gone and Christmas is near. A message of hope, love, joy, and peace is what we will hear. The message starts with hope for the stranger and then comes alive with a birth in a manger. The weeks to come will reveal many parts with a word from our Lord to change many hearts. Today we'll look at the words of a prophet and see the hope of Messiah that will come from it. Isaiah tells of a servant whose kingdom will last, who will bring forth justice to the nations amassed. This servant is promised by our Lord God in heaven, who created everything in days numbered seven. God calls us to righteousness, a light to the nations, while he holds back his hand and shows his great patience. So if you would, turn with me to in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 42 as I read verses 1 through 9. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 9. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. But the former things have come to pass, and the things and new things I now declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. As we go through this passage of Scripture this week, uh, this, this week's Advent represents hope. And we're going to see three things. First, we're going to see the Messiah's anointing. Then we're going to take a look at the Messiah's achievements. And then we're going to see the Messiah's assurance. Verse 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Now Isaiah refers to the nation of Israel as, as the servant of God many times. But he also refers to the Messiah as the servant of God. So when you see that in, in reading Isaiah, when you see servant of God, you kind of have to use the context to see, is he talking about Israel or is he talking about the Messiah? So you need to look at those surrounding passages. In this passage, it, it is definitely talking about the Messiah. Um, it's through the ministry 
of, of the servant or the Messiah that God will accomplish his great plan of salvation. That's the hope that people have in Jesus Christ. Um, God's plan of salvation is for the whole world. God chose him, God upheld him, and God enabled him to succeed in that mission, the mission of saving the world. And because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, one day there's going to be a glorious kingdom and God will bring justice to the nations. The millennial, the millennial, millennial, the millennial kingdom isn't just for Israel, but for everyone who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone to save them. When Isaiah wrote this, he foresaw five different things. Uh, in the coming of, uh, of the one that would come. First, he saw someone that would have perfect obedience, that would be upheld by the Lord. They would be specially chosen in possession of God's spirit and devoted to bringing justice to the Gentiles. That's what that verse, uh, bring justice to the nations. It's, not, it's nations plural, not just the nation or the people of Israel but to the Gentiles as well. So this first verse speaks greatly of the Messiah's anointing by God the Father. And next we see the Messiah's achievements in verses 2 through 4. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. And as I read that, it just clicked and it wasn't planned. It was kind of God's orchestration. I had just sat down or stood down there and I read Galatians 6 verse 8. Don't grow weary and doing good. And right here it says that the Messiah, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, which is good. God's awesome when he brings scriptures to, together that way. These verses tell us a lot about the Messiah and his mission and how he will do it or how he won't do it. Um, so first we're going to look at how he doesn't do it. It says he doesn't cry aloud or lift up his voice in public, in the streets. Next, he doesn't crush the weak. The Messiah doesn't stop until truth and righteousness prevail. That's justice. So if the servant doesn't do these things, then what does he do? Well, if he doesn't shout in the streets or in public, he lives a humble life. As I said, he, he doesn't cry out to be known of his own praises. We, and we see this in Jesus a lot during his ministry. How, how many times do we see him heal somebody? And then what's he tell them? He says, go to the temple and make a sacrifice for, for, for being healed, but don't tell anybody. We see that all throughout the the Gospels. Don't, don't tell anybody. Now, I don't know, is it reverse psychology? Because every single one of them, hey, look what Jesus did. Praise God, I'm healed. And, and you know, I, honestly, I don't think that's, that's what Jesus wanted. I think he really was saying, don't tell anybody. Um, because he, he's not going to shout his praises in the street. Um, Um, and, and oftentimes he was asked by several if he was the Messiah, and he refused to answer in the way that they wanted him to. In Mark 15, 2, it says, And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. So he doesn't even give Pilate, the one who is, is holding his life, the balance in his hand. And he, Pilate even said, you, you know I'm the one that can kill you. 
And how does Jesus respond? You can't unless God lets you. Paraphrase. But basically that's it. Um, so the servant or Messiah, he also acts with gentleness. In, in our society and culture, the weak often get trampled. They are left behind. They're ridiculed. They're just plain thrown aside as if they don't mean anything, as if they have no significance. Well, in God's economy, they do have significance because they're made in the image of God. And the person that Isaiah is talking about, this servant, acts with gentleness, and he realizes that. Isaiah says, The servant will not break a bruised reed or quench a faintly burning wick. Reeds were and, and still are. They're, they're used in, in manufacturing musical instruments or parts to musical instruments. And if they get worn, uh, warped, or cracked, they're not good for anything. And, and we just discard them. We throw them away. We destroy them. Same thing with a, uh, a wick that's too short on a candle. If, it, if, it's, if the wick's too short it, on an oil lamp or something, it, it doesn't produce enough light, what do we do? We we throw it away and we, we replace it. It's expendable. I can only say thank you to God for a servant who acts with gentleness because I was that bruised reed. I was that faintly burning wick. But Jesus acted with gentleness towards me in that he, he, continued, he, he didn't crush me like I, I probably deserved. He didn't quench me, extinguish me like that flame on the wick. He didn't, he didn't destroy me like a broken reed. He continued to call to me until finally I answered him, and, and then he saved me. So the Messiah acts with gentleness. The Messiah also brings justice to all and ushers in a reign of righteousness. Though Jesus acts in gentleness and, and, and is meek, it doesn't mean he's not just. It doesn't mean he's not thorough. And it doesn't mean that in his second coming, he won't come back mad. <laughs> he will ensure justice is done complete and right. This passage in, in Isaiah, it not only despise, er, despise, displays Christ's character in essence and beauty, but it also serves to model to us the character of servanthood. Anyone who serves God must first, they, they have to have a desire to serve God. They need to remain humble before others and dependent on the Lord. They need to be committed to winning others' release from sin's grip. need to be committed to witnessing about the Lord Jesus Christ that we can see them saved and come to the Lord. And they need to accept personal suffering as it comes to them. And finally, they, they need to rely completely on God for guidance and strength. And my prayer is that these characteristics that are shown in uh, Isaiah here as, as this servant that he's speaking of, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. My, my prayer is that these characteristics take hold of everyone in this room and lead us all to be better servants for Jesus Christ. So we've looked at the Messiah's anointing and we've looked at the Messiah's achievements. Finally, we're going to take a look at the remainder of the passage which deals with the Messiah's assurance. Verses 5 through 9 read, Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread the, out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to people, the people on it, and the spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, 
nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. The start of this is kind of like, it's, it's in a, written in a fashion uh, similar to that in Job, when God asked Job, where were you when I formed the fountains of the deep? And then on and on and on and on, question after question after question, and Job going, and, and, and so Isaiah gives us that same feeling that Job had. Job answered God, and he said, Behold, I am of small account. And, and all I have to do is look up in the, in, the, in the night sky, and if you look through a, a telescope, or if you look on the Internet and see some of the pictures from the Hubble telescope, behold, I am of small account. We are so small compared to God. So Job felt really small compared to God who had done all of these things. And here Isaiah says, Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. God has declared his authority. God has declared his authority to send such a servant as is being spoken about here in Isaiah. The remaining verses are words that are spoken by God to his servant. He's speaking to Jesus Christ. It says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant to the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to a carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So this is God speaking to the Messiah's assurance. And some of it, echoes what we've already read in verse 1 about the Messiah's anointing. Here it says, I have called you in righteousness, where in verse 1 it says, my chosen. God has chosen one who is righteous to accomplish the tasks placed before him. And this is another reason we know that he's speaking of the Messiah and not Israel. The Messiah is righteous and able to carry out God's uh, righteous will where Israel isn't. Later on in Isaiah, Isaiah 64, 6, he starts talking about Israel and, and their righteousness, um, which is a stark contrast. Here he's calling, calling somebody in righteousness, and, and it's to accomplish the task of saving the nations. But in Isaiah 64, 6, Isaiah tells Israel, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. That's the righteousness of Israel. So I know Isaiah is not talking about them. Verse 6 in today's passage continues, I will take, I will take you by the hand and keep you. And in verse 1 it said, Whom I uphold. God is assuring that this servant will have the power to carry out God's will. Not only does he have the righteousness to carry out God's will, but he has the power to carry out God's will because God is upholding him. God is taking him by the hand and keeping him. Isaiah says, I will give, I will give you as a covenant to the people. Last week, uh, we shared a Thanksgiving meal together. And after church, we all shared something that uh, we were thankful for in the past year. And if you guys haven't seen it, um, posted on the two back doors of the sanctuary are all the lists of things that the people were thankful for. So as you leave today, stop, take a look, and uh, take a look at what, what, what types of things people were thankful for this past year. So anyway, rabbit trail. Um, 
But after we, after we shared what we were thankful for in a meal, we also shared the Lord's Supper. And what was it that Jesus told his disciples as he, he prepared to drink the wine? He said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So God spoke of this through Israel in today's passage several hundred years before Christ even came as a babe in a manger. He said, I will give you as a covenant to the people. Verse 6 then says, a light for the nations. And this is exactly how the Messiah is introduced, Jesus Christ is introduced and described in John chapter 1. It says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is referred to as the light all throughout the Gospels. Verse 7 reads, To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Now, we read in the Gospels, at least, we read in the Gospels, at least four accounts of Jesus healing a blind person. Um, maybe five, but I think two of them were the same account, different Gospels. So we're, we're looking at four accounts of Jesus healing the physically blind person. And it says to open the eyes that are blind. But Jesus even went beyond healing the physical blindness of people. Um, we, we read the account of four people being healed physically. But how many people did Jesus heal from spiritual blindness? Oh, man. In, in the Gospels alone, countless. In Acts, what is it? 3,000 came to Christ the day that, the, of Pentecost when, when Peter preached. He's healing spiritual blindness as well. When Jesus opens the, eye, the eyes of the spiritually blind, he accomplishes the rest of verse 7 in today's passage. He brings out the prisoners from a dungeon and from the prison those who sit in darkness. When he saves us, he saves us from that dungeon called sin. That's exactly how sin is described in the New Testament. We are, in, we are slaves to sin. We're in bondage to sin. Sin is our master. I mean, over and over you see the likeness that when you're lost and without Jesus Christ, you are a slave to sin. We are imprisoned in darkness. So... He's moved us from darkness to light, just as Isaiah has written. Today's passage closes in verses 8 and 9, saying, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. That last verse, it reminds me of something in the New Testament. He says, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. That sounds an awful lot like um, when we're crucified with Christ, old things have passed away, and new things have come. It sounds an awful lot like the New Testament. God brings new life through Jesus Christ. And God declares his authority to send such a servant into the world and gives the Messiah's assurance. So God gives the Messiah's assurance during this Christmas Advent season and we find hope in the words of Isaiah. So we can see the Messiah's anointing. We see the Messiah's achievements and the Messiah's assurance. This passage of Scripture uh, gave Israel hope in the coming of a Savior. Now, they were confused about what that Savior was to do. They were looking for a ruler, a king that could rule them as a nation and get them out of basically bond, the, the bondage of the Romans. That's what Israel was looking for. Not necessarily when Isaiah wrote this because they weren't in... Roman rule then, but they were looking forward to a hope of a Messiah that would bring 
salvation. And it came true. This was a prophecy of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ coming, and he did come about 2,000 years ago with the birth of Jesus Christ. But a portion of today's passage is still waiting to be fulfilled. In verse 4 it says, He will not grow faint or be discouraged till, the, till he is, has established justice in the earth. Do we see justice in the earth today? <laughs> Far from it. But he doesn't grow faint or discouraged, and he won't until he brings and establishes justice in the earth. There will be a day when justice will be done throughout the whole earth, and that will be in the second coming. So just as Israel had hope in the first coming from, from Isaiah's prophecy here in Isaiah 42, just as Israel had hope of a Savior to come and save them, we have hope in the second coming of the Savior who has already saved us, that he will establish justice in all the earth and return everything to the way it was before sin. As we draw to a close, let me ask you, do you have hope? Let me ask another question. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ which brings hope this Christmas season? If you don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, um, you've heard me say it many times before. You've heard Russ Berlew say it. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about the relationship that can save you from your sin because you've lived in rebellion to God. If you've not, if you don't have that relationship, might I, might I ask, beg that you today you turn from your sin, you agree with God, I've lived in rebellion, I haven't done the things you've wanted me to do, and turn to Jesus Christ and ask forgiveness and for him to save you. Maybe you have, maybe, if you are a Christian, maybe you have other decisions to make, one of church membership, one of missions, one of ministry. Talked about don't grow weary in doing good. Maybe God is calling you into a ministry to do more good. Whatever the, the case may be, come up, pray, give your life to Christ, surrender your life wholly to Christ in ministry if that's what he's calling you.